everybody. Thank you very much. Welcome back to our live studio audience and to everyone watching across Dem Internets. I'm Jeff Durbin. This is next week. Very special guest right now on the show. We have Lauren Green McAfee. Uh, she is the corporate ambassador of Hobby Lobby, known to Christians worldwide. <laughs> Lauren, welcome to next week. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. Oh, it's our pleasure. So, uh, Lauren, what's it mean? What's that, that title, Corporate Ambassador for Hobby Lobby? It sounds amazing, but what, what exactly do you do? Uh, yes, it, it's a fancy title that just means I do company communications and PR. So I get to work with a lot of great stories and share those with the company as well as the outside world. Excellent, excellent. Well, we love Hobby Lobby, especially all of us Christmas freaks at Christmas time. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm actually always there. And I just, I did have a question. How many Christmas trees do you think is too many? <laughs> well, I have to say I have eight that I put up in my house. So definitely at least eight is okay in my books. Okay, well that sounds like a problem to me, Lauren. Um, <laughs> eight Christmas trees. Um, so uh, just a question, uh, just it's on my mind. Uh, just why around Christmas time do you sell synthetic squirrel tails? Is there a big market for that? <laughs> I have no idea about the synthetic squirrel tails. <laughs> I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering um, if, if the factory that's house producing those does damage to your bottom line if they, if they do stop. So, um, so we, we wanted to have you on today because you guys are just doing so much. I mean, for, for us, we know about the Green family, your family, and we know just really, I mean, about the, uh, the amazing business model of Hobby Lobby and the kinds of things that you're doing. Uh, we also know, of course, about the, the recent legislative battle, the, the fight you guys had in terms of standing up for your convictions um, in the area of health care. And um, we also know, of course, that you guys, your family, has uh, one of the largest privately owned um, uh, um, collections of biblical artifacts really on the planet. And so it really is compelling. I, I guess let's start the discussion off this way. Um, Talk to us, if you would, about the, the re fairly recent conflict uh, where you guys were really trying to hang on to your convictions really as believers with a successful company in terms of what the government was asking you guys to do. Absolutely. So what you're referring to is what's often called the Hobby Lobby court case, Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case. And that all began back in 2012, whenever the HHS mandate or Obamacare was handed down. And after we got to understand what this meant, we realized that that mandate would require us to provide the 20 FDA approved contraceptive drugs and devices. Now Hobby Lobby was already giving a wonderful benefits plan to our employees that did cover 16 of those contraceptive drugs and devices. It was only four of the 20 FDA approved materials that we did not want to provide because we realized that those were abor abortifacient in, um, in what they did actually. So because of our convictions, our deeply held religious convictions, we had to make the decision, do we provide these four drugs and devices that go against our deeply held religious convictions? Or do we say, no, we're going to fight this and, and fight for the ability to follow those religious convictions? And following our faith in business has always been something that has been a key at Hobby Lobby for my family. That's right. My grandpa founded the company on his own over 40 years ago, and he's continued to live out his faith and his biblical principles every day of the business ever since. So we we were nervous that we were not gonna be able to continue to live that out, but um, thankfully we have seen the victory in the court system. We went all the way up to the Supreme Court and we did have the 5-4 decision in favor of Hobby Lobby's case. Right so on. we do get to live out our faith, thankfully. Well, I, I, can, I guess the, the good thing, and, and to thank God for that, that victory there, uh, that we would probably love to hear about um, is just how this affected your, um, your faith, your walk with Christ. I mean, it was a pretty intense legal battle. I mean, when, we had a, our, when this was happening, we were talking about it on a radio program, encouraging people to be prayerful about it and to get engaged in the issue. But give us sort of a behind the scenes. What was it like for you guys to be really the focus of much of the nation and the media in, in this fight? What was it like for your relationship with Christ and being Christians with this very successful business and business model? Just tell us about that. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked because 
you mentioned that you were asking people to pray. And so every time I get to speak about this, I just want to thank any of the listeners or people I'm talking to that we're so, our whole family is so grateful for those that were praying with us. We felt the prayers of people all over the country and really all over the world. We had many people reach out to us that were supporting us. So while we may have been on the quote unquote front lines of this particular issue, we know that this was, we were not alone in the journey. We had many people walking alongside us. So we're grateful for that. Um, but yes, as, as a family, it really was a, an interesting season. It was a two year process from the time when we first began this battle to the Supreme Court decision. And all of our experiences in the lower courts, we lost in all of those court decisions. So it it was no uh, cakewalk. It was uh, very stressful at times, but ultimately we, we all realized we have to put our faith in the God that we believe in and trust that he is in control of this. And, and that gave a lot of peace. And also just the prayers of people all over the country really made a difference in bringing us peace through all of it. So we knew that we had to live out our convictions and whatever happened in the end, God was going to be good. And so one particular story, um, we found a passage in in the Bible that was particularly meaningful whenever Daniel is facing um uh, again, kind of a similar situation, the government of right. his day saying yeah. that he had to do something against his faith. Um, and, and he stood for what he believed in. And so we put, um, Bible verses, uh, around the campus and, and would share Bible verses with each other as a family and even bought a billboard across the street from where our corporate office is and placed a Bible verse on there just to give us encouragement yeah. that people before us and people in scripture have, uh, followed God and God takes care of his people, even if it may not be the way we expect it to be, he is still in control. Oh, that really blesses me, Lauren. I got to tell you, I mean, I, I know we're not, you know, very familiar with, with one another, but I, I do want you to know, and there's people in, in the studio right now, uh, that we, we all remember doing episodes really trying to, to sound the alarm and encourage people to get involved and to pray and being on the other side of the trial now and, and seeing your faithfulness and seeing you guys stand up for your convictions and ultimately refusing to bow uh, to the state in the way that you did is just such a tremendous encouragement to me and I, I just want to hopefully bless you with that. It, it is such an encouragement to us in, in a time and a circumstance that we live now where, where so often Christians divide really the world up into uh, the secular, the sacred, the secular, the spiritual, and they, so many would be willing to let go of their convictions in an area like this because there's a potential for loss, a loss of business, loss of capital, and uh, you're taking a stand and being salty um, and being light in this area is, is really a tremendous blessing to us. So thank you guys thank for your faithfulness. You. Um, and now let's get to the really cool thing. This is exciting for me. Um, I know all about your family and <laughs> in terms of not just Hobby Lobby. That sounded kind of creepy, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that sounded creepy. I know all about your family, uh, Lauren, uh, every detail and where you keep your credit cards. Um, <laughs> I, I know all about the Green family because I'm a pastor and um, a theologian, an apologist, a philosopher, and so I engage in a lot of apologetic stuff. And what excites me so much about the Green family, your family, uh, many of us know who are in these circles that the Green family has this amazing collection of biblical artifacts. Um, your family has uh, been, been faithful stewards of what you have actually gained. Uh, and, and actually been able to produce some amazing finds, uh, biblical manuscripts, I mean, so much stuff that has, has, many people don't know, has actually changed the landscape in many respects in terms of like manuscripts that are um, extant that go way back and closer to the time of Jesus and the actual writing of the New Testament. It, it really is awesome. And so I'm, I'm kind of a freak about these things. And so I'm super excited. So with that large collection of things and what you guys have invested so much in as a family, you now have in our nation's capital, you have the Museum of the Bible. That's right. So tell yes. us about that. Yeah. So ironically, we were beginning the journey towards Museum of the Bible right whenever we were in the middle of the Supreme Court situation. So it was around the same time that we were traveling to and from D.C. for the Supreme Court and, and, the, and all the oral argument and everything that we were buying a building there in D.C. for the purposes of Museum of the Bible. So 
Um, it did start as a private collection, and that was kind of the impetus for what is now mu uh, the museum. But it is the largest private collection in um, in the one of the largest private collections in the world of biblical um, materials and artifacts. And that collection is the foundation for what is on display in Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. today. So the Museum of the Bible is an eight-story building that is 430,000 square feet of space that is all dedicated to the Bible. It opened in Washington, D.C. just a couple months ago in November of 2017. And in the first two months of the museum being open and opened, we saw a quarter of a million people go through and people have been really enjoying it. This is a museum that is not just a boring place with some dusty materials. This really no. brings the Bible to life. Yes. It is one of the most technologically advanced museums in the world, and it's incredibly engaging, and every all of the environments are very immersive, and it actually, it actually invites you into the stories as you walk through. So I think that there's something for everyone, even if they're not interested in the Bible or of no faith at all. But there's also something for uh, people of all ages, backgrounds, you name it. There's something for everyone at Museum of the Bible. Awesome. I, I uh, was at a conference in uh, Tennessee, and uh, your family had uh, sort of a, a, a mini exhibit there, uh, like covered up and dark and everything. And, and I remember going inside this and seeing some of those artifacts and manuscripts, and it was just absolutely astonishing. And I mean, there was a sort of a, a bit of trembling involved in walking up to these uh, these items that were carried by Christians, and, and, and it's, just, it's just an incredible, incredible thing you, you guys have invested in. Let's do something kind of fun here. I, I want to ask you, um, tell us some of the very interesting things that we will find in the Museum of the Bible, because maybe some people think that sounds boring. <laughs> I find it delightful, yes. um, but I'd love to just hear what kind of interesting things are inside the museum. Yeah, well, that's a great question, and there are a million different answers I could give you. Um, but in the museum, the, the main three exhibit floors talk about the history of the Bible. So what, how, is, how did we get this book? What is the history that brought it to us? Um, we also have the floor that talks about the narrative of the Bible. So what are the stories from Genesis to Revelation? And then we also talk about the impact of the Bible. So I think that some of the unique things that you'll find is that there are video docents all throughout the museum, and those will guide you. Even um, David, David Stott, who drives through history, does the drive through history TV program, he did a drive through the Bible. And so you can find his video vignettes all over the museum. Uh, but I think that one of my favorite parts about the museum is the Old Testament walkthrough. So this is a timed 45 minute experience where you start, that we let a group of 15 people in every five minutes and you start at the beginning of the Old Testament and you actually walk through from gallery to gallery an experience that brings you through the story of the Old Testament. It's incredible, it's very theatrical. People from Disney helped us put this together. Oh, wow. uh, everyone is sure to enjoy it. So that's, um, there's a burning bush that looks very realistic that you'll see whenever you're going through. So it's it's a really incredible experience. But that's just one sample of what's on the, the narrative floor, but there are great experiences like that on every level of the museum. I'm really so excited about this. I just cannot wait to, to see the whole thing finished because we, we knew years ago that it was happening. It was sort of underway and under construction and we saw bits and pieces and we were absolutely thrilled. So um, let, let's let you let's get let's let you give the pitch, Lauren. Why should people uh, get on a plane and come to the nation's capital to go to the museum? The Bible has impacted every area of our world whether it's technology, science, fashion, art, literature, you name it, even in ways we don't even realize. So whether you're interested in the Bible or not, but I think that a lot of listeners are interested in the Bible, um, it's an incredible experience to get to walk through the Bible and really experience it in a new way. So we hope that everyone will come uh, experience the Bible. It would take nine, eight hour days to see everything in the Museum of the Bible and read it. So we realize most wow. people are not going to give us that much time. But come and at least spend a few days with us. We've got a restaurant, a coffee shop, a theater where you can see shows. We've got so many things for families to enjoy. Oh, so man. we hope that you'll also follow us on social media. Museum of the Bible has a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And that can also give you a little glimpse into some of the incredible history and story of the Bible if you're not able to make it to Washington, D.C. Okay, so two more questions, Lauren. One. Can you tell me, because I'm just a to total geek about this thing, can you tell me of uh, an interesting manuscript 
that's in the museum or just something with some history behind it that's just really compelling? Absolutely. So my favorite artifact that is a manuscript is called the Codex Climaci Rescriptus. We bought it from an auction house in London that was being sold from Cambridge University. It is a manuscript that has been rewritten on. So it was an early form of recycling, actually. This is made out of vellum, which was on animal skin. It was written in the 6th century in two languages. That was uh, Syriac and uh, Palestinian Aramaic. And then in the 9th century, someone tried to erase that text and rewrote on top of it in Greek. There are portions of the Bible on this manuscript in both layers, and it's fascinating to be able to find some of the largest portions of the Bible in Palestinian Aramaic on that underneath layer that is only accessible through modern technology called multispectral imaging. So we're able to read a text that's mainly been hidden for centuries, but because of technology, we can now access it. So it's just a, that's just one example of a really fascinating artifact that has been a recent discovery thanks to modern technology, that this manuscript had never been read before. And there are portions of it on display in the museum. Fantastic. And the next thing is uh, we have uh, social media platforms and connections really worldwide with the audience that uh, watches us, whether it's on the NRB network or across Facebook and YouTube. And um, I, I would love for us to be able to come out there and to, to film the experience of the museum ourselves and see it, uh, to promote it so that the whole world can see it. Uh, so it's Come on over. Not we'll really a, a question. Tour. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. That's all. <laughs> That's, That's great. <laughs> so, all right, Lauren Green McAfee. Lauren, how can where do people go uh, just to get more information and to, to to find out how to get tickets and location? Where should they go? The main site. You, yeah, museumofthebible.org will have all of the information as well as links to our social media feeds. All right, Lauren Green McAfee, everybody. Thank you so very very much. God bless you. Thank you. All right, everybody, thank you guys for watching next week. We'll be right back. Stay with us, important things on the other side of this.